Okay. Uh, Navjot, uh, to you. Um, your work has been collaborative across disciplines, across media. You've lived in different places, most notably in Bastar. And over to you. Hmm. If you can. I am going to project uh, an extract from my latest film, uh, which uh, I will be showing soon in Bombay, Soul Breath Wind, because uh, it may, I don't know whether it's going to be distracting, but I feel the need to have it because this way one can get a sense of people's voices, what they have to say, and what my observation has been. So before I begin, I would like to thank Goethe Institute, Dr. Martin, Ravi Agrawal, and House of World Culture, that, which actually, um, 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 what should I say, you know, they um, encourage us to have this kind of conference. Thank you. So uh, my paper is like jottings from my diaries over the years. And uh, so uh, there are many uh, things that I have put in, and uh, I have uh, titled it Patterns That Connect. But if my points don't get connected, it is, not, uh, it is intentional in a way because a lot of things are not as smooth as uh, when you read them and you uh, sort of, um, you know, um, at that moment find extremely relevant. But after a few years, when you start analyzing and looking at it again, then you see a uh, lot more questions coming out of those. So um, patterns that connect, this paper is titled Patterns that Connect, and the title is derived from, the, from an anthropologist, Gregory Betson's study of cybernetics, which is concerned with the interwoven nature of all phenomena and the underlying importance of these connections. This makes me think of Edgar Morin, philosopher and uh, sociologist, who acknowledges Betson's understanding of totemism and animism versus modern knowledge. I quote, anthropologically, it would seem from what we know of the early material that man in society took clues from the nature, natural world around him and applied those clues in a sort of metaphoric way to the society in which he lived. That is, he identified with the natural world around him and took the empathy as a guide for his own social organization and his own theories of his psychology, and this was what is called totemism. It makes more sense than what we do today, because the natural world around us really has a systematic structure and therefore is an appropriate source of metaphor to enable man to understand himself in his social organization. The next step seemingly was to reverse the process and to take clues from himself and apply these to the natural world around him. This was animism, extracting the notion of personality or mind to mountains, rivers, forests, and such things. This was still not a bad idea in many ways. The next step was to separate the notion of mind from the natural world and then get the notion of gods. But when you separate mind from the structure in which it is inherent, such, such as in human relationships, the human society, or the ecosystem, man already embarks on a fundamental error, which in the end will surely hurt. In the present context, he says that our whole way of thinking and seeing has got to be renovated from the inside out, to see the connections and rediscover our part within the web of life is an intellectual, spiritual, and emotional revolution, quote unquote. Throughout my interaction and collaboration with Adivasi artists and local communities over two decades, both in Northern Central and in South Bastar in Chhattisgarh, I've experienced and sensed that the Adivasi existence is embedded in the cyclical processes of nature and they still believe in the webs of relationships. Their cosmovision does not view humans as outsiders from nature. 
As, as I was experiencing, what I would like to point out here in short is that as I was experiencing the Adivasi way of life in Bastar, uh, which enhanced my aesthetic experience, my interest in the writing of Gregory Betson and Edgar Morin also grew simultaneously. And before that, I had read a number of people who had intervened in um, such areas um, from India. And uh, simultaneously, I was reading these uh, writers also. So I was interested in sensing the culture other than I had grown up in, the in the indigenous knowledge system and modes of learning, which, further which furthered my interest in the science of complexity and led to questions like, how do we engage in inquiry? How can we live and think in a pluralistic universe? How any intervention or experimentation or alternation in nature without sensitivity concerns or recognizing the vision, vi vision of local communities who conserve natural resources for centuries could disrupt systems of relationships and subvert the ecosystem. It is here that I reflected on the crux of deep ecology, which views the human as part of a greater whole, and the concepts of ecological aesthetics, which calls for rethinking human and non-human relations as always mattering, always affecting, and always political. Ecological aesthetic is aesthetics of integration at one level and probing into the historical roots of the fast-growing culture of unsustainability on the other. By engaging myself with the Adivasi struggle for justice in mining-affected districts, Raigarh and Korba, I got to experience the concept of aesthetics of sustainability, which inquires into the meanings and implication, implications of justice in a pluralistic way. And it also conveys humility towards the non-human environment. I would like to share a few examples of how the human and non-human shape each other and how do they converse with these inhabitations. From a ritually enacted oral epic Lakshmi Jagar, which is an extended allegory of the origin of the rice production processes, I would like to narrate a conversation between Pavan Kumar, who is a right-hand man to the king and queen of clouds, called Queen Meg, King Meg and a spider. It is when the queen Meg from the upper world wants to go down to the middle world that she needs the spider to suspend a thread for her to slide down. The spider tells Pavan Kumar that she's busy for two days and if the queen can wait, she will do so. What one understands here is that in the myth, the spider is not represented as a being with no ability to reason it has its own independent equal status. Then on her visit to the middle world, Queen Meg gets a pond dug up for the villagers and they celebrate it through a ritual of marrying the pond to the mango tree next to it. The ritual is called Tarai Amba Byaha. They establish a relationship, this way, they establish a relationship between themselves, the water and the tree. Betson's in his book, the Steps to an Ecology of Mind writes, examining the nature of the mind, seeing it not as a nebulous something, something lodged some, somewhere in the body of each man, but as a network of interactions relating the individuals with the society and his species. Another example is from Koke Renge. Koke Renge means a cock-like walk. This dance form is performed by the Muria community of Bastar after the harvest every year. The performers travel and travel from village to village to pay tribute to the Lingopin, the head of all deities who symbolizes the entire earth. The dance involves the movement between human and non-human forms and the circle, in my opinion, form by, formed by the hundreds of performers from different villages over three hours signify continuity and connection. My observation has been that even though, like the animals in, in a zoo, domesticated animals are considered to be the, 
property of the human beings without ind independent status of their own, and how through more and more control over the natural surroundings, the human worldview has changed towards the separation. Yet, during a festival called Gobardhan, not Govardhan, but Gobardhan in Bastar, the food cooked out of all the grains cultivated in the area is eaten by both human and non-humans from the same plate. Adivasi's belief in tra treating their animals as living beings with the equal status is still practiced. Gobardhan is to recognize the animal's contribution in the food production. On Amustihar, called Hari, Hari, also called Hariyali, animals are given their first shot of medicinal herbs for them to retain, to remain in good health. Roger Boyd, author of Humanity's Test, writes, how the Eskimo of Alaska view animals as non-human persons and the ongoing relationship between animals and humans as central to their worldview is central to their worldview. This relationship is seen as one of reciprocity, with the animals only surrendering themselves to the hunters who have respect for them as persons in their own right. Here, I would believe that rather than the differences, the similarities between humans and animals are emphasized. Both are believed to have souls and which participate in a cycle of birth and death. They're also seen as sharing the ability for self-awareness and the ability to control their own destinies. These multiplicities, in my opinion, are not condemned. Despite the right-wing forces trying to Hinduize the Adivasi culture, culture by reinforcing the patriarchal, val patriarchal values and the mainstream education system neutralizing the cultural difference at one level, these mul uh, at one level, there are histories of resistance, and one can look at um, not very old case of Neamgiri Hills from a mountain range in Orissa, which was defended by the Dongria Kon community against the multinational Vedanta a company forcibly wanting to mine aluminum ore in the sacred mountains. The local community's spiritual belief and resistance has saved the rich wildlife and the forests. Sacred grooves in forests are considered reservoirs by, the other, by these communities. In Bastar, beautiful forms of animals are created in terracotta from time to time in the year for the offerings at such sites. The Koila Satyagra in Raigarh in Chhattisgarh is another example. It is similar to Gandhi's Salt Satyagra, for which thousands of people had walked hundreds of miles, sorry, thousands of people had walked hundreds of miles in defiance against the British salt monopoly. It also reminds me of the Red Power Movement by the American Indian youth in the 60s and 70s which had taken a confrontational and civil disobedience approach to incite change. Since 2011, people from mining affected communities in Raigarh marched from Gare and 80 adjoining villages to the bank of Kello River to challenge the monopoly of the coal industry and to claim their rights over their natural resources, including coal under their lands to protect their rights over continuing agriculture as their occupation, and to generate power through solar by using their own resources. These villages as a community of resistance have been successful in stopping the forced accusation of tribal land for mining in many blocks. A similar movement has taken place in Jharkhand's Hazaribagh district as well. According to the judgment given by the Supreme Court of India, in July 2013, the ownership of ores and minerals beneath the ground belonged to the landowner. Agriculture, according to them, does not affect the soil and harms no living organism. 
Their belief in harmony with nature encourages cooperation within the environment, communities, family, and the individuals. They believe that if humans do not cooperate and respect the relationship with the land, water, and forest, their existence will be in danger. Their belief is also in the unified action. With their intervention, this is the Koila Satyagraha community, the community of resistance. With their intervention in Supreme Court, the National Green Tribunal Act was established first time in India in 2010. I will end, it, end by saying that since land is being assessed as a base for development and enterprise to increase the GDP, it is complex to understand within the commonly accepted notions of ownership or property, Adivasi relationships to land, forest, or animal or water. I will end with Betson's quote, which is, gives me hope. The need is to rearrange our mental landscape as there is a necessity for an awareness of being part of relational contexts, persons, groups, populations, genders, and all species. Thank you. Thank you, Navjot. Um, <clears throat> I want to open up the three papers to a discussion within the panel and then eventually to the audience. But before I do that, I want to take it back to what Ranjit had begun with, is this talk of the two languages, you know, which you call the language of policy and the language of generosity. But I'm also wondering whether we are, all three of you actually, have spoken about other kinds of bilingualism across which the representation of nature by artists or by even by activists, and here I'm using the word representation in both senses uh, as representation and also in the political sense of representation, necessarily happens across divides, ruptures, disconnections. And whether peculiarly, you know, we have to remember in our rubric that phrase in India, you know, all of us speak at least two languages, English being one of them. And all three of you, in a way, have sort of moved across languages as translators, as artists, as speakers. You've moved across different registers of speech. You've moved across presenting work, talking about your work, making work. You've moved across speaking to people, reading about speaking to people. So whether division and schism and rupture is built into your enterprises necessarily and how you would respond to that and eventually you too. <coughs> I should think about it before I speak, but I'm thinking as I speak. So for me, uh, rupture, discontinuity, uh, usually often marks a moment of growth, mm -hmm. a moment of release of uh, previously uh, too comfortably aligned or uh, ossified energy. However, all rupture is not necessarily productive. I mean, uh, in the sense that rupture will produce, but what it produces can vary hugely according to circumstances, conditions, etc. And there I think the question of um, whether one works with rupture as an artist, whether you work with rupture even in terms of the kind of experience you create in your artwork, whether you describe or refer to or metaphorize rupture, or whether you take rupture as a given, even in the act of making work. Uh, these would be different ways of perhaps responding to what you're saying. Mm. Navjot, I would like to ask you, how do you experience 
distance or compassion across distance when you work in a place like Bastar and make work out of that? See, my, when I, I felt that uh, when I first went there, mm. I did not speak Halbi. And, um, but I also realized that Halbi is a kind of, uh, it's a language um, which is a mixture of Marathi and Hindi. And uh, so I uh, started uh, sort of, you know, making sense out of what they were saying. But then over, you know, I soon understood that, you know, listening is the beginning of communication in my mm. um, case. So I started, instead of, you know, forcing myself to, you know, uh, that I must uh, sort of, you know, uh, you know, communicate in the same language, I started listening more than I spoke. But, uh, but that's not simple either because you're communicating and th that is where the problem is. You know, so how is that? Some, so many things we take for granted that, you know, in our own environment, either you speak in Hindi or English or the, your own, um, you know, language that uh, you have spoken from your childhood. But fortunately, because one spoke more than two, three languages, I think it also came to me quite easily. But again, I would not claim that I understand. And I um, always feel there's a lacuna in, you know, what uh, I'm understanding. And that is where, you know, sometimes your judgment, you know, how to judge, you know, that is where the problem comes. And it's not that one is judging, but in your mind you are sort of also perceiving few things, you know, you're understanding. And that is where I see that you need to, you know, constantly, um, you know, pinpoint and rupture your own way of looking mm -hmm. at things. Ranjit, so, how does this translate into translation? <laughs> For me, uh, uh, when I was thinking about how this grand machine of the state and the modernity that it stands for, when it meets and overwhelms indigenous communities, uh, uh, people who are defenseless against its workings, for me the tragedy of language there is that you have this language of law, of notifications, of gazettes, which is incomprehensible to its victims because they are its victims. And conversely, there is no listening from the grand machine of the state as far as what I've called the languages of generosity are concerned. They're actually derogated as dialects, as um, uh, folklore. There's a way in which a whole apparatus of, of science and of, of knowledge is used to crush these languages of generosity. To me, that is the great tragedy here. Or at best, they're reified or fossilized and they become kind of linguistic artifacts. And generosity itself can be sometimes a very uh, ambivalently crushing experience, isn't it? If I it mean, comes in the form of, of subsidies. I'm thinking of Marcel Mauss and, and, and that whole way of thinking about the gift the and weight of giving. Of the gift, yeah. mm. I'm reminded of Ramanujan's mother tongue. Yes. And, uh, and the distinction is really between the language of the market, the court, the state, which was father tongue and mother tongue. And I want to add to this a comment which I somehow left out in my uh, attempt to stay within time, that when we're speaking of the Anthropocene and we re-inflect it to the capital of scene, recognizing the actions of capital, we have to equally re-inflect it as the Anthropocene, where it is actually patriarchal structure and uh, the particular hierarchies that are produced through gender that are a, a way of understanding what we are calling the, andro uh, the Anthropocene. So I would propose thinking about the Anthropocene. I'm very tempted actually to move to Mukul <laughs> straight away because I know that you write and teach in two languages in Hindi and in English, at least uh, in two languages. But I'm hoping that you would uh, incorporate that uh, experience of division and, and two-ness or doubleness when you speak. So, and, and since we are going to move on to you after the break, I thought I'd take this opportunity to open it out to maybe just a couple of questions now to the audience, and then we'll come back for a longer session of Q&A with the audience at the end of the remaining three. Yes, do you want uh, Thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. I guess I, I, guess I had a... Uh, uh, 
a question for Namjot Altaf. I'm thinking a little bit with um, Professor Bilgrami's response to Ashok's question yesterday, where he described that we, well, many of us, if not all of us, live in different states of alienation and unalienation back and forth all the time, right? And, and here, this also like we can think about language as one way of thinking about going back and forth. And if you can say a little bit about how, I'm um, looking at the videos and thinking about your words, about how, what kinds of back and forthness um, Adivasis and Bastar might be going through as you navigate um, bulldozers, taps, trucks, on one hand, and the cosmologies you described on the other, right? Are these um, cosmologies of confrontation, as is definitely the case? Or are they also, so are they like living in two different worlds? Or are they living sometimes in what um, um, anthropologist Marisoldo Lakadena described as um, more than one world and less than two worlds, right? Um, um, because, because there isn't um, an e habit two worlds at the same time. So if you can say a little bit about how um, these events have actually um, compelled them to maybe deploy different languages to make political claims. You talked about Vedanta as well, um, languages of the state, um, perhaps. Um, or are they, are they this in inhabiting two worlds and, and, and where confrontation is, is the only possible outcome? Uh, you know, I work in two uh, parts of Bas the South Bastard, and this is in Onda now. And Ondaga also is, it's not directly affected by either the uh, Maoist, uh, you know, uh, kind of environment or uh, mining. But close to, within 50 years, that is in um, Kanker or in Dantewada and or in, um, say, northern central part. So both places when I see, uh, in certain parts when you go to the interiors, you know, of even Abu Jamar and all. There's a lot of uh, things are happening. And there is, um, uh, you know, CRPF camps every five kilometers or 10 kilometers. Uh, when you go there, you can sense it. And when you talk to the people, and they do talk, you know, you can see the, what they have to speak about, you know, um, you know, who is an exolite? You know, I mean, I, it's taken me many years to understand, you know, um, how am I going to talk about these things? And then the time came when that over years that uh, they were familiar and they saw me more than maybe 100 times. I never used to go with tape recorder or with any kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, idea of documenting. Idea is that how do you establish that kind of relationship with people, which is not easy because I'm always an outsider. Can I become a face, like, can I become an insider? Is I don't think it's possible because even though they are, uh, you know, um, uh, they uh, do talk about, uh, yes, there is, there are two, two things happening and, um, and the effect of that. What I'm trying to show here is the effect of these two worlds. You know, for example, this, you know, the dance performance that Koke Ringham talking about, which only takes place at night. You know, it starts at, do it starts at midnight and ends at dawn. It has been stopped because the fear is the Nexalites will. That's what is police is, uh, I mean, the CRPF and other police, uh, you know, forces um, uh, perception that they might attack, so they should not have. So they have it in a hurry for about two hours, in the evening only, around, 8 to 10, but you know, the people, the whole, um, the spiritual uh, experience, this is actually, this particular performance is not for anybody. It is for people themselves, for the villages, when they travel from one place to another, they get together and they're actually singing whatever they're singing for the well-being of the, like I said, lingo pain means entire earth. They are not singing for their village or their own this. So that is now, Finishing. So these are the effects I see of this double this. But they continue and they still believe in, like I said, that, you know, no, I've said these things. Uh, no, it sounds, I like to be very optimistic and I believe that maybe because even when I read scientists like James Hansen, he says that there's hardly any turning point, but if at all we have to save the planet, then we have to think of certain ways which are closer to. Um, you know, um, Adivasi or indigenous or primitive, whatever 
people like to call because every word has so much you know it, it, it's so difficult to speak also about but I'm just uh, sort of going to use these words and um, so that's the only way so I see hope in that but I also see how difficult it is even for me for me the kind of contradictory life I live myself in the city and when I go there you know it is it's not easy so even the artwork sometimes I feel that I I've started calling my artwork like uh, you know Boris Croix's um, paradoxical objects that we are making you know we we have our empathy with that but our lifestyle is such you know even if you cut down on you are live with the minimal but even that is so contradictory if we start you know believing science what it is saying how we need to cut down and all so it is very it is it is they are but then there are more questions with that you know now for example Manish Kunjam that I was mentioning that he feels that all these things are for, for them they are forced upon them you know, it's not that the change is taking place. Change is inevitable. They also talk about change, but there's a lot of this, uh, like alienation, all this terminology that we go with and ask this question. There's a lot of these things are being imposed on, on us also. And who is doing it? It's not. And they ask for give us the history when how much have we destroyed and how much the what is happening now is destroying in how much. I think before the break, we'll just take one more question, and may I show sure. you? Yes. And Ravi, we'll come back to you because there'll be a longer opportunity. Just quickly as a response yes. to and the could fact... Could you make your question quite quick? Yeah, so that just that we saw question. images of some, of some things that we've been speaking about very imagistically since yesterday, in some ways. Uh, and then she was really... Uh, wonderful thing. She had this line about the HD image and what it's separating us from, maybe. So just quickly, if you could, and uh, this comes from sort of, we have a image archival practice and since we're like we start to recognize images of the same places like Korba, shot by different people over the years in different, completely different ways. Right? So what are these images of coal mines and of power plants and of ash ponds sort of doing? Because the friend who shot this before us was walking, looking for the image of the problem. And he walked from power plant to power plant in Janjgir Champa, in many of these same places. There are 39 of them, 40 of them. And then he finds the ash pond, and for him that's like the revelation. He walks over it, and the ash pond is open in front of him. And that's where the image of the problem is first seen, not in the chimneys and, you know. So, these images are doing something, and I'm just wondering if either Shiba or you wanted to talk about these as images of ecology. I think with all image regimes, and I would say that the environmental images is constituting a new kind of image regime, a new symbolic regime, and uh, which is interesting because it goes from National Geographic to the most radical progressive kinds of articulations. Yeah, it's, I, I know that that's yeah. not your intention. I'm, I'm just talking about the kind of uh, regime or the kind of flow of images within which all these environmental images seem to go and sit. And I, I think it would be very interesting to examine the difference between the celebratory mm -hmm. and the lush images and the new kind of, uh, call it environmental porn, which is the constant imaging of the horror, the disaster, which has taken on certain particular aesthetic forms, which we find reproduced, which we sometimes unwittingly reproduce ourselves. I'm not saying this about Navjot's images at all, I'm just it's a general comment. Uh, I, no, I, I want to just say in one line that, you know, these, now, for example, I'm not interested in the spectacular kind of images like a lot of artists have, you know, they take. Uh, um, um, helicopters and then they will take the images and then they you know make their art. I believe in standing on the ground and looking at and it is also looking at what it is doing to the environment uh, to the landscape. So I'm also interested in the landscape what landscape let's say if I had gone there 20 and every time you go to the same site it's a change site. 
you know, if you take just one area, let's say you take Kosampali, it's not the same next time, you can't recognize it, so the way it is sort of changing. So, and what is it changing for? That is what my interest is also, you know, so to raise more uh, serious questions about do hold on to your questions. Uh, we'll come back to you. We'll take a short break now and then reconvene and, and carry on.